traveling home on a through train to air Cash in my pocket and plenty to spare Wearing a school cap and traveling half fair I love my height, it suits me In spite of those big brawny chaps all around The ladies adore me, at least so I found Cause I've got a sporran that's nearer the ground Oh, I love my height, it suits me he twinkles when he performs. He twinkles. It's the only word I can think of. I was twinkling there. You weren't sure. When he had a show, I said, why didn't you call it Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? And he, but he, he thought about it. He said, yes, mm, possibly, but he didn't. Enough of that, please. <laughs> Maybe he didn't like the word little in there. But Twinkle Twinkle Star doesn't sound the same, does it? Sounds like solicitors. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd like that. They're just... <laughs> slight suggestion of style there. I... It is a style that I can't really compare to anybody else. Sort of sweetness, sort of sweet, friendly innocence. Just so happy to be entertaining you. wonder if it's true that Mickey Mouse wears a Ronnie Corbett watch. <laughs> My parents took us to see him in um, Eastbourne. I think it was the Congress Theatre or the Winter Gardens. And uh, the curtains open and he comes on. He's, he's wearing a, a kilt and uh you know a very smart little jacket and uh and then and he says which is it was what everyone's thinking isn't he small you know he's small on tv when you see him live he's tiny just walking about a bit you know stretch my legs and people um, left it a bit late haven't i people and he had all the strings to his bow he could move well he could sing he had all the armory that was the thing coming from all his training he could do almost anything ronnie and he was just waiting to be unleashed on an unsuspecting world. I love the way he moves, the daintiness. So neat, so acute. No wonder all the women, even when he was doing Ugly Sister, were saying, oh, you just want to lift him up and cuddle him, you know, like a little doll. A slip of the tongue here and I could be back on Teletubbies. I remember joining lots of things, you know, at school. Joining the Dramatic Society and joining the Literary Debating Society and turning up for rugby training and cricket practice, but not really ever being good enough to be selected or to take a really desperately active part. So I really wasn't good at anything. I passed through school unnoticed, really. I remember strongly never being bullied or teased, so I must have shown some kind of way with myself, because usually little chaps tend to go through a bullying experience at school, so I didn't suffer from that point of view. I was in the Scouts, and I did become the troop leader. Ow! The Scout tree were the first people to give me an air of confidence, really. Here we are the again. church put on a Christmas show, and I had a major role of the wicked aunt so I was in drag very early and that was the turning point and that moment and that feeling and the ease with which I made people laugh in that show that was intoxicating of course it is quite an intoxicating um, noise as we know hey, little Billy Pratt what a funny fella so bananas on the street they were so big and yellow they soon became quite famous and wherever people met they vowed they were the ripest and the best they'd ever eat. And now throughout the land, you'll find them near at hand. You see, Captain Boyle, if you go there to stop, wherever men and women meet, they're always popping up. You don't win silver cups no more at races than Jakarta. You prizes now a handful of your Billy Pratt's bananas. I was fortunate in national service as well, because as I say, when I went in, you see pictures of me when I was in the Air Force at that age, age of 18, I really looked like about 12. The most impressive thing about Ronnie that I remember from those days was that he was a pilot officer. Now, it was quite difficult to get a commission in the RAF, and to do it when you're not six foot four took a lot of determination and a lot of personality. I sometimes wish that I'd kept on with that course on positive thinking. <laughs> I did it for two years and I couldn't make up my mind whether to stop or not. <laughs> Edward's mother, Pixie, was an absolute darling, and when I came out of the Air Force, she held my hand and guided me in the proper direction. She lived in a lovely house in St. John's Wood, and I had a flat in the basement. She would have lovely warm dinner parties at the house. 
One night it would be J.B. Priestley and Rafe Richardson and Coward himself. It was just really intoxicating and, and wonderful of her and very confidence-giving, you know, to be invited. And we managed to eventually to get to the Café de Paris to see Noel Coward, who was doing cabaret there. And funny things that you remember, I remember Ronnie was always immaculate about his clothes and Coward had fairly unusually for that time, was wearing black suede shoes with his dinner jacket. Ronnie noticed that straight away. And the next time I saw him with his dinner jacket on, he had black suede shoes. And I thought, oh, that's not a bad idea. And I then went out and bought some as well. I just remember being knocked sideways by the whole style and his skill with words and skill with songs and all the stuff he'd written himself. Mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. The Japanese don't care to. Chinese wouldn't dare to. Hindus and Argentines sleep firmly from 12 to 1. But Englishmen detest stock. Pixie would push me about to see if she could find something for me. Boule used to give me singing lessons at Dianley Studios. And finally, Reginald Beckwith, who's a very, very funny character actor, had written a script an adaptation of a bridey play called What Say They that was going to be done, um, and it was about Glasgow University. Are you staying here long? I don't know. Yes, perhaps. Oh, good. I think you'll like Scary Boy. It's a bit cold at first, of course, but I always find that after a week or two, I never notice the cold. Come on, we'll be late. I suppose so. Well, we're sure to eat again, aren't we? Oh, we must. Yes, mustn't we? Au revoir, then. Au revoir. I have enjoyed our little chat. Have you? Nothing has ever surprised me about Ronnie. He did eventually have a, an evening doing cabaret at somewhere called the Stork Club in Streatham. And a man threw dinner rolls at me during the performance. Um, and as somebody who asked, these hard Vienna rolls, you know, quite damaging, quite hurtful. And Ronnie just stopped and looked at him and the, said the classic comics thing, I thought I told you to wait in the car. He's brought the house down immediately got the audience on his side and this guy was unceremoniously bundled out of the club but i thought there's no way he's not going to be a success if you can do that with a lack of experience which he had at that time you can do anything that's brought a tear to my eye that way. he's a toughie you know because i remember with other feeds i had always if there was a laugh that went on and on and on i liked to time when the next line should be spoken if it was a feed line and i used just to gently touch the arm, which meant speak now, you see. Well, I realized that I picked the wrong person to do that. I sort of just gently indicated with my arm, and Ronnie said, don't give me my time. <laughs> so I thought, yes, uh, this man wants his own timing, and he's very ambitious, and yes, I think he'll probably go places. Tonight the Palladium, tomorrow the world. <laughs> He did a charity for me up in Scotland and he came in and it wasn't quite right, you know, the way they'd set it up and everything like this. And uh, he wasn't um, a, a bit embarrassed about saying, no, this is no good. I need that there, I need this there. And, there. and he was very sure of what he required to get close to the audience and the way he wanted the lighting and the way he wanted everything else. Um, to the point of, you know, somebody said to me, oh, he's a, he's a bit, I didn't think he was like this. And I said, he is a professional comedian. People usually say to me, what made you decide to become a comedian? Which is what I am. And I also, <laughs> no, I always mention that very early. Just in case. And, um, no, well, there might be some foreigners in the audience, you know. <laughs> you think I'm a glove puppet. People always attempted to make me a sort of Gump comic, you know, could make me a sort of Charlie Drake or um, Normal Wisdom, where, you know, you were very put upon or, you know, covered in whitewash or slosh. Have you ever made a record? No. No? Would you like to? I'd love to, yes. We've got a recording booth here. Just come over here. Really? Now, if you could stand just there. Yes. And I press this button here, we start recording, you see? Yes, but what do I sing him? What yes, you... well, any song. What about uh, White Christmas, eh? Would you sing White Christmas? Yes, right. Any time right, you like. Right, right. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas just like the 
But I always kind of resisted that, and I always had my sights set on a more elegant form of being funny. Just look at that cutie, a thoroughbred beauty. She must be the favorite, it's plain. Yes. Her form, it looks great. Just a bit overweight. Look, her breastplate is feeling the strain. <laughs> She's too much to carry. Oh, I wouldn't say that, sir. Well, you wouldn't describe her as one for all the flats, huh? I say, chaps. She's adjusting her straps, and she's hanging a bit to the right. <laughs> she started to cough. Good Lord, are they off? No, no, but they will be tonight. <laughs> I enjoy looking a bit sprawncy, you know. And, of course, in our days in the, in the business, we were brought up to be, to put, to, you know, to to dress up and put take go to a bit of trouble and look the business when you went on the stage. That's the way we... I mean, we didn't sit about in our stage costume. Comedy club, people arrive in the outfit, the T-shirt they're going to work in, and then they have a drink with you in the T-shirt they've worked in. And, I mean, <clears throat> when we were growing up in the business, it was more magic than that. You had a dressing room, you change, you put on something sparkly, twinkly, and with the curtains opened, Somebody, a person was there, you know. The nightclub scene in the 60s was amazing. We were appearing at Winston's nightclub off Bond Street, uh, Ronnie and I, and Danny LaRue, who was absolutely king or queen of that scene. And Danny got his own club in Hanover Square. Mine was the first nightclub really to do a review. It wasn't just tits and feathers. It was lots and lots of topical things, and we had wonderful audiences. We had film stars, we had royalty. You really did get a wonderful chance to sing, to dance, to do comedy. Um, and the audience used to be about five inches away from you, you know, so you had to really be on top of everything. And Ron and Dan together were just magic. Happy feet, we've got those happy feet. And now they will repeat, we're happy to care. Day Margot Bunting and uh, Rudolph near enough. Margot and Rudy used to come in, and he always got very nervous, Ronnie. So what a good, what a good thing, what a good thing. Danny looked so beautiful because he was the most beautiful woman and the, and the most handsome man. And then Ron didn't look so dapper, he had, you know, tights on and it looked so ridiculous. You're not using your posture. Not using my posture. I, Rudy Boreoff, tell Rudy Boreoff. <laughs> Jock strap from Aberdeen. <laughs> And what about Elsie Quilt from Wapping? You're not her as well, surely. <laughs> Come to me, my little sugar plum. Sugar plums are fairy. Any question? It was wonderful physical imbalance. Uh, playing, I'm playing all his hero, the heroes to this. <laughs> <laughs> this giant of a, a, a glamorous lady. Hello, sailor. <laughs> a very good combination, the two of us. Don't you understand that you, you have a great beauty? I had two when I came on. <laughs> what if Corbett learned how to be such a, a good female from LaRue? That would certainly be a master teacher. I don't know if he likes doing drag or not, but he's very good at it. Freddie Carpenter, when my name was just beginning to become known, asked me to do Ugly Sister with Stanley Baxter in a new production of Cinderella, brand new Howden Wyndham at the Alhambra Theatre in Glasgow in the great days of Howden Wyndham Theatre. Freddie Carpenter, who was a great character, said, Well, I don't know if you've ever seen Danny LaRue at his club off Hanover Square. And I said, yes, I have. He said, yes, but do you remember a small man that was feeding Danny? I said, yes, and I was rather impressed by him. He was very funny in his own right. He said, yes, well, I said, the only trouble is he's not Scots, I don't think. He said, he is, you know. I said, really? Oh, I said, that I think he'd be ideal. And so he came in to do the show. And we got on like a house on fire. Oh, he's wonderful. Wonderful, ugly sister with Stanley Baxter. The, I think that was almost, for me, the best pantomime, and it was the most beautifully put on pantomime. I used to dream up crazy costumes. I remember I was a bottle of Squeezy, and 
he was Omo. And we appeared in mad costumes like that. I had the children with me when they were very tiny. And I went into this shop and I said, Oh, please be quiet. I'm buying your father his stockings. And the copy on the counter nearly fainted. So, I said to that shop assistant lady, I said, It may look tight to you, love, but to me, it's a perfect fit. You, are you talking about your bra again? Yes, dear. The sheepdog bra by Gusset. <laughs> sheepdog bra? Why is it called a sheepdog bra? Because it rounds them up and heads them in the right direction. His wife laid them up so well that it was no longer a man in drag. Because of his height and build, it was a little lady, but a very beautiful little lady. He looked just like his mother. I thought, my God, it's Nan. <laughs> and Freddie Carpenter said, well, I'm sorry, I mean, you have to be a man in drag, that's the joke. You can't be a little lady. I look up to him because he is upper class, but I look down on him because he is lower class. I first met Ronnie when he was serving behind the bar uh, at the Buxton Club, which is a little theatrical club behind the Haymarket. I am middle class. I know my place. I looked over the counter and he was standing on a box. Well, he was standing on two boxes, actually. There were, there were two boxes side by side. And he was standing on one, so he looked perfectly uh, uh, as tall as anyone else, you know. Um, and his one said, Champ, on it. it. said, Champ. So I thought, oh, that's what they must call this guy. He's the Champ, you know, he's got his name on this box. And then he walked across, up down the other end of the counter, and it said Agnes. And I thought, <laughs> I thought, oh, well, well, is he Agnes or is he Champ, you know, or is he both? And, of course, it was Champagne's. It was a box cut in half. <laughs> I get a feeling of inferiority from him, but a feeling of superiority over him. I didn't work with him then until Frost report. I get a pain in the back of my neck. David Frost had seen me in the club, and he ran me up and said, I'd like to chat to you because I'm going to do the show called The Frost Report. And I was actually in twang at that time. He said, if twang runs, I'm afraid you won't be able to do it. But if twang comes off, which it looks like it very well might do, because it was one of the big major disasters, West End musical disasters of all time, uh, then you'll be able to do the Frost Report. And, of course, um, twang did f fold quite quickly, and I did the Frost Report. It is the verdict of this court that you be taken from here to a place of execution and hang... It was a complete turnaround in my life, really. I understand you've been riding a bicycle without lights. I brought the nightclub attack to the satirical writing and gave it a kind of vaudevillian edge. There we are, there we are. That's enough, that's enough now. That's enough. Don't go potty, don't go potty. <laughs> Sorry I'm late, but I got held up. Oh. Thought you'd never ask. Car broke. Thought you'd never ask. <laughs> no, piston broke. Story of my... Ah, not too quick, please. He was from a variety background, and I was from uh, uh, an acting, a legit background. Uh, although, personally, I don't think it makes any difference where you come. I mean, I think acting is acting. You're acting when you're a stand-up, you're acting in, in variety, you're acting in pantomime, and you're acting in repertory or whatever. Oh, look! The menu's shaped like a rook. It's the name of the restaurant, isn't it? The Pleat Rook. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, it's written sort of all different, mm. isn't it? I don't know where... Yes. Eh? We no, sorry, I'm talking to my friend. You're not a comedian or an actor. You are an actor who likes playing comedy. There's Rook Patty here. <laughs> Rook Patty. Do you recommend the Rook Patty? Only when we've got a lot we want to get rid of. <laughs> the goodwill the public had towards them before we even started the two runnings was so enormous that I think it was a hit right out of the box. We, we premiered on a Saturday night, and it was an instant hit. Doesn't seem to be the sort of restaurant to come to if you don't like Rook. <laughs> Not the sort of restaurant to come to if you do like Rook. He's very good in a double sketch where the balance 
the comic balance is really on the other person because he's just as funny because he reacts so well. He's not cheating it. He's not trying to steal it. He's just perfectly sincere, which is in itself funny. Got any plugs? Plugs? Yeah. Pl what kind of plugs? A rubber one, bathroom. <laughs> What size? 13 amp. <laughs> we were doing sketches which were nearly believable, really. They were nearly funny through being real, weren't they? I mean, the, uh, the ironmonger's four candles was a uh, fellow who runs an ironmonger shop with, a, with an honorary customer coming in and trying to be awkward, and you'd believe them, and they were funny because there was an air of reality about them. The electric plugs, the electric bathroom plugs, you call them, the tray. <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie C is never given his full due as an actor. It's a very, very funny piece where he's the squash player who has had the mortifying experience of being on court and having a complete novice beat him all ends up. Oh, no, that's not right, no, because I remember distinctly you did get a point early on, didn't you? Yes. Yes, only because you had... Oh, I know, I was holding the thing by the wrong end, wasn't I? <laughs> I was trying to push it. Yes, I remember that. Yes. Yes, I must remember you hold the bat by the thin. The racket. The racket. The racket. Yes, the racket. This is a racket. Yes. You see what I mean? Yes. The game is called squash. Yes. We play it with a ball, and this is a plastic racket. <laughs> <laughs> Will it work now you've done that? <laughs> Look, I don't care. Do you understand? I don't care. Because I'm not going to play squash anymore. I love the telephone scene in whatever it is, the train station, when they're at adjoining telephone booths and their telephone conversations begin to, <laughs> to, to make sense as a dialogue. The best thing I can do, dear, if, is to go through the list with you. Yes, yes, that's a good idea. So what was she like? I mean, what sort of girl? A French bread. Oh. <laughs> Bloomers too large. <laughs> Well, kept slipping down, you mean? <laughs> oh, well, if you will go ice skating, you will keep slipping down, won't you? Yeah. And rolls for 20p. He doesn't. <laughs> what did you say her name was? Hovis. <laughs> I think I know her. Listen, isn't, isn't she pregnant at the moment, though? No, no, no current bands, dear. He never approximated the lines. He always learnt them absolutely as script. You know, he was very, very precise. We did a thing where he had gone deaf. It's the gun, sir. Yeah. Gun, sir, can't hear you properly, so you see, with the guns. Halfway through the sketch, everything he heard seemed to do with, be to do with food. Um, he would, he said, um, I said, go away and let me die in peace. And he would say, would you want some gravy on that, sir? And I, I'd say, what? He said, gravy on your pie and peas. I think you'd better get up a tree and risk it. Oh, thank you. I could just do with one, sir. One more. <laughs> a cup of tea and biscuits. <laughs> Get up a tree and risk it, man. Sorry, sir, I'm sorry. Well, go on, make a start. Make a start, sir. What make a start. start, make a start. What's the matter with you? Do I have to repeat every stupid little word? Well, sir, no need, no need to be personal, sir. <laughs> what? <laughs> Calling me that, what you did, sir. I said stupid little word. Oh, oh sorry, sir. I thought... Before the two Ronnies series, actually started on uh, BBC TV, there were two specials to sort of ease them in. And I came up with an idea, Ronnie Corbett is Romeo, in a Romeo and Juliet sketch uh, set to the music of Sousa. He jests at scars that never felt a wound, but soft. <laughs> that I know that I was uh, starting something because uh, it went well and uh, ever afterwards for the, the proper to run these programs we had this big musical finale.
became very difficult to do. They took a disproportionate amount of our time to do them. For instance, when we did the brass band, we used a real brass band from Aldershot. And they came up to our rehearsal room and we rehearsed and mapped it all out for about three hours one evening. And they went back to their jobs for the next two days. Then they came up Sunday when we did the show and we just shot it. I would be terrified to try that now. Tell me as you love life, Jack. Full of the joys of spring, mate. Is he still the six-foot brunette? The one with the enormous Her name is Mary Jane She works at the mattress factory She says that life like a bed is what you make it As long as you take it lying down I had a letter from some lady Is it true that you and Ronnie Corbett are brothers? <laughs> and I wrote back and said, well, I don't think any mother would call both her sons Ronnie. <laughs> Ronnie, where's Ronnie? You know, all that would go. And then we'd all have a damn good time. All pieces and cream. And vodka and lime. You eat the drink, ain't a pain in crime. Enough is enough, let's go and get stuffed together. There are plenty of pens in the box on the sideboard. I knew that, dear, but where's mine? Mine, I'm looking for. <laughs> no, that's me over here. It was basically a mixture of office comedy and domestic comedy. <laughs> Thank you, dear, but that's not quite the point, you know. Where, where is mine? You know, I shall need it tomorrow, dear. It must be somewhere. It's a plastic one with a black top. I always think that's a very difficult role to play a very sensible wife to a silly ass husband, you know, and she did it quite beautifully. Do you mind dry? No, uh, thank you. Right. Ha -ha! It was slightly surreal, and I was his wife. The same safe bit of his life, because whenever he went to the office, all the, the office doors were much bigger than him. And Ivor Dean, who was Ronnie's boss, sat at a desk which was absolutely enormous, and it was all photographed to make Ron look slightly smaller. Ronnie called it half an hour of lying and hiding. Come out now. <laughs> this man, who was always in terrible trouble at work. What are you looking for? A, a bit of plastic, sir. Um, don't worry, I'll find it. Ah. <laughs> you found it, sir. Never mind, sir. I couldn't get on with the bloody things anyway. <laughs> get up, Norman. Get up. Stand. Yes. yes, right. I know I said I had had some time this morning, Corby. <laughs> I'd be grateful if you would avoid one of your more circuitous peroration. Yes, sir. In other words, get to the point. Yes, sir. <laughs> your face is a bright red. Are you ill? Uh, no, I'm all right, sir. Is there anything you. wrong with your eyes? No, I'm all right, sir. Excuse me a minute. <laughs> this is so wonderfully Ronnie, the pretension. Doing a makeover. I'm trying to change myself. What are you doing? Uh, shall I ring for an ambulance? No, I'm all right, sir. I'm all right. You get the contact lenses and then the attempt at tanning so his face looks ridiculous and I think this is one of his enormous strengths the pretension and pomposity and then puncturing it Im immediately because he's very funny in real life talking about himself it reflects him <laughs> Aberdeen was the quintessential boss for Ronnie he was always trying to look at something in the boss's office or retrieve something. So, where shall I hide? The filing cabinet. One moment's thought tells you there's no way you can hide in a filing cabinet. But it's worth it for the orgasmic moment when you pull the top drawer out. <laughs> David Frost had as his guest Bob Hope, and I was walking along the corridor. How odd this must seem. The door opened and out walked Bob Hope. I mean, I was absolutely gobsmacked. You're coming out of a room going, and I mean, here was my hero, my god from the Palladium and the and the days of the Palladium and the films, and and he and he stopped. I said, Ronnie. I said yes. He said, 
He said, I watched your show last night with Bing. <laughs> he said, in Tom Jones' dressing room. And that cute little bit in the filing cabinet <laughs> came out. So I thought, my God, my heart. I couldn't speak. My mouth went dry. I said, oh, my very funny bit. I said, how old are you? And what, what have you been doing? And I thought, God. Well, of course, I was walking on air. And we, I went in to see the interview, and all his Mickey Rooney jokes were now transferred to Ronnie Corbett. So I, I was getting all the short jokes from America were delivered about me. Sir, might I leave the cabinet? Please do. Comedians used to being up there by themselves to get them to be part of the team, the, the, get the focus in the right place at the right time doesn't necessarily come natural to the to a comedian but but Ronnie always had that he was a great team player all right her name is Annette she has a full range of working parts and optional blue eyes <laughs> just as I thought a jumped up little thing from nowhere what do you mean I'm only a jumped up little thing around here <laughs> you know what I mean What's her background? Background? What do you want me to do? Take references? Don't be impertinent. Impertinent? Language, Timothy. Oh, shut up, father. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it does help the fact that he is short. It suggests to you that, that he's, he's behind the rest of us, perhaps. Um, so we made him a 40-year-old who's still at home and still living with mother and father. All joints on the table will be carved. <laughs> what, pardon, what? Elbows. <laughs> You haven't been promoted at work. Quite right, Mother. At the library, promotion goes entirely on elbows. It's the same all over the world. President Reagan swept to victory on the elbow vote. The wonderful thing about Ronnie is you write a script and he does it. He doesn't come along and say, I don't like that line, cross that bit out, not that scene. He does the script. I always let Ronnie B read everything as well, because he's such a good judge of words. said when he read the first one, it's the best thing you've ever had written for you and I think he was right. Mother, I'm Look at your face. What? Lick. Mother, that's a duster. <laughs> Look at you. Oh. Anyone would think you hadn't got a mother. I think they know. <laughs> Who else would comb my hair and give me a lick wash in public? It appealed to me because he was, he was he's a perky, cheeky, uh, viperish son trying to break out of his mother's um, influence and out of home and lead his own free life and it was a sort of Walter Mitty because of course he saw uh, he saw himself leading a life he had no hope of ever achieving but he remained perky and impudent throughout and he had a license to be cheeky because he was in fact gr a grown up so she'd always say you know have you wiped your feet and he'd say I've wiped everything in sight mother you know and he, he could be <laughs> he could be a cheeky annoying little bugger <laughs> to get down from the table. No, I wish to get down from the cliff, Mother. You are driving me mad. And don't shout in front of the canary. We haven't had a canary for years, That's Mother. That's not the point. Oh. Mind the marmalade. I will mind the marmalade, Mother. I will mind the marmalade. By Jove, I shall mind the marmalade. The appeal to the kid in all of us, you know, it was uh, your uh, dad being a kid which is a great way of getting your own back, wasn't he? But then every now and again he would stand up to his mum, uh, which was an, a way of getting back at your mum as well. A shock, horror, scandal, as middle-aged man goes out two nights running. Don't you realise, Mother? I must be my own master. Goodbye. <laughs> Briefcase, sorry. <laughs> Gloves. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. And it's the man preserving his dignity, which is funny. I mean, he's doing it very consciously there, but nonetheless, that is there. You know when you see someone slip on the pavement and, and then straighten out as though nothing has happened at all? Well, he's brilliant at doing that. There's another scene where he is playing bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream. The woman that he's struck by comes in and dumps him, really, and just says, I don't think we should see each other again at the moment or at all. And he's sitting at his makeup table, and he's got with him the mask of the ass, the ass's head. I don't think you and I should see each other for a bit, Tim. <laughs> no, I, I didn't mean that. I... <laughs> I mean that I don't think you and I should see one another at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good 
Good night, Timothy. <laughs> Ralph Richardson couldn't have done it better. The pathos of the ordinary man being struck down by some awful emotional calamity and yet uh, looking faintly ridiculous and making the audience laugh. And the audience are, in fact, laughing, laughing very much without him saying a word. And you can't make an expression un inside a mask. But they aren't, in fact, finding it funny. They are clearly very deeply moved. The thinking was about Timothy Lumsden's engagement that we'd better try to get him off our hands. And um, we couldn't go on forever having him not engaged. You have to apologize to Jennifer. I will not have you spying on her suggesting nasty things. She's a very nice girl. You've got some of my new trifle on your nose. This is no time for trifles. <laughs> you are offended my fiance. I am not your fiance. Well, I should hope not. Well, you know what I mean. No, I don't. You've never asked me to marry you or anything remotely like it. We don't quarrel in this house, thank you. All right, will you marry me? Yes, I will. Right. You have definitely <laughs> offended my fiance. Now, do you want... Did you, did you say yes? Yes, I did. <laughs> did you hear that? I am engaged! Hey! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sit down, that's what he brought to stand up. <laughs> this old lady goes down to her local pet shop and the assistant behind the counter says, I have got the ideal companion for you, he said, madam. He said, a nice little puppy, only six months old. Uh, so she looks at it and she says, yes, that's very nice. She said, very nice, very nice. She said, do you think it will replace my husband? I mean, you know, that my husband was a warm, he was affectionate and he was always doing little jobs around the house. <laughs> In that case, this is definitely the dog for you. I, uh, I, did try, I did try to say that quickly. Anyway, she said, well, I'll tell you what. If the dog doesn't mind, I'll take it. So they asked the dog, and the dog said, yes, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> and off they go. There you are. You see a talking dog. Already the joke has got novelty value. <laughs> that's about all it has got, but anyway. Although the whole thing was scripted, he gave you the impression that it was being ad-libbed. And, of course, by having an exceptionally large chair, again, it made him look tiny and vulnerable. And uh, if there was any weaker parts in the script, he was able, with giggles and things, to just get over it. The, the feeling that uh, he, he was making it all up and half apologising for being there at all. This joke is so old, it was found buried with the Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> As was the comedian who just told it. <laughs> The great Spike Mullins approached him when he was doing the Corbett Follies and said, you know, you do a lot of waffling when you do these monologues. He said, I could waffle you funnier than that. No, forgive my laughing, because I've heard all this rubbish before. He was an amazing man, Spike Mullins. He was this very dour, um, retired builder from Slough. I, I always called him the, the despond of Slough. <laughs> Making out your own jokes. Part used to ring me and say, give me a joke, and I'd give him some old classic joke. And, of course, he'd write it up for Ronnie, but the joke became the least important part. It was Ronnie's waffle and digression that became wonderful. And I think the audience warmed to that. He had this wonderful way of changing direction all the time. So he would say, if you're thinking that it is the story about the Irishman who was shipwrecked and found a lifeboat and broke it up to make a raft. It is not that one. I wish it was that one, because that one's a damn sight funny than the one I could tell. But what I wanted to say was, this fellow had been, you know, very often, and he, and so you were just about to get on the track of what he was talking about, and he take you off in another direction momentarily and bring you back. Now, to cut a long story short, the lady becomes devoted to this dog, and every afternoon at tea time, regular as clockwork, she takes him for a walk down to the newsagents for her evening paper. Well, one day, many years later, her legs are getting a bit crotchety, so she calls the dog in and she says, now listen, Tiddles. <laughs> I don't think her eyes were too good either, anyway. Listen, Tiddles. If I give you the money, do you think you go down and get my evening paper tonight on your own? And the dog says, yes, I can do that, no bother. <laughs> and I just made that bit up. He has that about him, that sort of discursive style. And often when you meet kind of people you hold in high esteem, they're not what you expected. But the great thing about Ronnie is that he's just like that. She gives him the money for the newspaper. She says, now, you're sure you don't mind? And the dog says, no, I don't mind at all. Because <laughs> he's got the money in his mouth. <laughs> 
and he waddles off down the road while four hours go by and there's no sign of him. My God, she thinks perhaps he's been kidnapped. Well, perhaps, perhaps she's got tangled up in a toilet roll somewhere. <laughs> oh, well, it happens. Anyway, so she throws on her hat and coat and she begins combing the streets and eventually, just as she's passing a dingy little alleyway, she hears this scuffling noise and there, to her horror, is her little dog with the little lady dog, as it were. <laughs> you know, having a good time amongst the dustbins, you see. So well, she, she grabs a nearby bucket of water, throws it over them, and then drags the dog to one side. She said, well, she said, really? I've never seen you do that before. And the dog looks up and says, well, I've never had the money before. <laughs> I directed the two Ronnie's London Palladium show. I would go in night after night just to watch his 20-minute uh, stand-up because although it was kind of the same, he would vary it a, a little bit. The skill with which he did it was, was so enjoyable. Seeing him manipulate an audience and, and bring them along and hearing 2,000 people in the London Palladium laughing was a, was a very rewarding experience. Could I have my Stradivarius violin, please? I want you to know there's been no bickering backstage about this. The atmosphere couldn't have been nicer. The repose, just like Jack Benny. Good thing I didn't ask for a piano, isn't it? Don't gabble, don't rush it. Lean back and let them come to you. I took a correspondence course in this. A hundred lessons I paid for, but I only ever received the first two. And I'm not accusing anybody, but it's a bit of a coincidence that our postman is now working under the name of Yehudi Menuhin. Ronnie is a student of comedy. He has such respect for other comedians, an affection for other comedians. Do I hear a snigger of doubt? I met him up in uh, Edinburgh. He came to see uh, my show there, and he'd just been to see Alan Davis. Very good, by the way. Excellent. Which I thought was remarkable for someone who should have been around for so long. Why is he telling us all this? Why is he telling us all this? I had a feeling you were going to ask me that. When I was doing my show uh, in Edinburgh Festival, he turned up to it, and it was a great honour to have Ronnie Corbett uh, in the audience. Jim Tavery had this uh, uh, very good idea, he thought, and I thought, actually. Well, what we'll do is we'll smuggle you in. Uh, the audience won't know you're there. And when the curtain goes up in front of my audience, you're sitting there. The lights come up, and there's this, the chair with Ronnie Corbett sitting in it. And uh, the audience couldn't believe it. I got the most tremendous welcome, tremendous ovation. I don't know why didn't think I would get some sort of <laughs> response, but I got more than I thought I would get. And then I walk on a minute later and go, Ronnie, wrong gig. Pathetic, isn't it? <laughs> I think he's very much game, and I always felt, felt that about him. The long-lasting effect of shows like the two Ronnies, because of the quality of the writing and the money it was spent and the production values, the effect of it is still present in even young people's lives, you know, the cues to get into these alternative venues and Anne and I arrive to collect our tickets. And, you know, I could almost have been on the night before in the two Ronnies, such as people's memory of them. And your time starts now. What is paleontology? Yes, absolutely correct. <laughs> What's the name of the directory that lists members of the peerage? A study of old fossils. <laughs> Who are Len Murray and Sir Geoffrey Howe? Burks. <laughs> Correct. What is the difference between a donkey and an ass? Uh, one's a trade union leader, the other's a member of the cabinet. It's very rewarding, really, to think that the effect has lasted as long as that, really. Who is Dean Martin? Um, he's a kind of artist. Yes, what sort of artist? Um... <laughs> Pass. That's near enough. Ronnie is the tallest man I know because he thinks tall, he acts tall. In 1982, I lost an awful lot of money, everything I had in a fraud. But you know, Ronnie and Anne rang me and they just bought the house in Scotland. And Ronnie said, Dan, we don't really need the house. We can sell it. And I had to hang up because I was so emotionally moved. Can you imagine somebody offering their home? That's friendship. Ronnie uh, and his wife and, and my wife and myself have, have been great friends for a long time. Um, we, we spend a year in Australia, of course, and, we, and, and, and the two girls got to know each other very well. We soon became the best of chums, did we, dig? Yeah! I'm 
play the piccolo, he played the drum, I'm still a Jew dick, yeah! But I had shouted off, so we knocked it on the head, and we formed a one-man band instead. The two of us, just me and Ted, didn't we, Ted? Yeah! I go, he goes, I go, and he goes, he sometimes, when we should go boom, when he goes, I leave the room. <laughs> I go, and he goes, we're renowned throughout the land, we're the only two-man, one-man band. He's a perfectly normal, happily married guy, you know, uh, which is lovely. So am I. Touch wood. Is that wood? No, that. That's my leg, so I haven't got a wooden leg. A little wave, if I may, to my wife and the mother of my children, <laughs> in case either of them is looking in. He makes the best of everything. He always has. If he makes you a boiled egg, he will coddle it for you properly. He will do the toast all beautifully. And when he does it for the, our grandchildren, he puts the toast all in little things like this on top of each other, like a little castle. Whatever he does, he does beautifully. And as I told you, I was uh, had a heart operation a year and a half ago. So he literally cooked for me for a year. I mean, I ate like the Savoy. I mean, he's the most wonderful cook. The other day I went up with a tray to Anne with tea and toast and bacon and egg and sausages. <laughs> and Anne said to me, that looks really lovely. I said, it is. Why don't you go downstairs and get yourself some? <laughs> I think you are fortunate if success comes to you a bit later in your life when you've bashed about a bit and you know how much it means and how valued it should be and how treasured and nurtured. I got my senior citizen's rail card two weeks ago and the rather embarrassing thing about it is that the week before I was travelling half fair. I couldn't see myself doing nothing I don't think ever know. I think I'll go on in a quiet way until I <laughs> pass over. <laughs> he really should be canonised, and he's just the right size to fit into a canon, too. He's a very kind man, he's a very thoughtful man, as being, and, and he still, believe it or not, makes me laugh. Rick Corbett, purveyor of high-class vaudeville, by appointment to Anne Hart. <laughs> Mrs. Corbett. 100%, he wants 120%. And that's Jack!